Okay, good evening, everyone. Just like Sister Coco said, tonight we'll be finishing the remainder of the book of Nehemiah. And so let us open up in prayers. Heavenly Father, um, we just want to say thank you so much for gathering us here today, Lord God. We thank you that as the week is slowly coming to an end, you allowed us to be here to study out your words and finish out strong the book of Nehemiah. We thank you for the lessons and uh, techniques that you've been teaching us, Lord God, how to serve you and how to start a project and finish it and see it's a completion. Lord, we pray that may these lessons not go void, but that may they be placed in our lives and we, may we see the fruits that they um they bring forth, God. Let us not be hearers of the words, but doers, Father God, so we can shape our lives and shape our world by your words, Father God. You said the steps of a righteous man are ordered and it's ordered by your words. So let us live on your words. Let us meditate on your words day and night and seek to know you more, God. Seek to des uh, desire a close relationship with you. Um, I want to lift up the hand, lift up Sister Coco, Lord God, as she will be uh, ministering tonight, Father God. I pray that may your Holy Spirit fill her up and give her the right words to say. May you give her wisdom and discernment, God, so that way she can speak as a vessel unto you, Lord God. And also I pray you do the same for myself, who will be sharing the rem remainder of the chapters. I pray for all the sisters and brothers that will join tonight, God, that may they be blessed and may they also have wisdom in adding the things that they need um, to add, God, that you instruct and direct them to. Lord, we thank you for this blessed session and we ask that may you be here, Holy Spirit, and may you get the glory in this whole session. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Marlies. The Lord bless you. Welcome, family. Tonight, we'll be discussing the remainder of the book of Nehemiah, chapter 10, 11, 12, and 13. I'll be covering the first two chapters, and Sister Malice will finish with 12 and 13. As uh, always, before we study the word, we are going to take the Lord's Supper. So please gather your communion element. You can say amen if you have it ready. Amen. 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 Welcome, Sister Bena. Thank you. Welcome, Sister Dede. Welcome, Sister Perdita. And Sister Miranda. Amen. Amen. Today, we are going to discern the blood of Jesus with uh, Luke, two, uh, Luke 22, verse 19. And I read, And he took bread, gave things, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Amen. Tonight, we are going to remember what Jesus did for us. How his body was broken and he gave it up to us so that we can be a new creature, so that we can have strength, so that we can walk the uh, pages of scripture, so that we will advance his kingdom. And he said we should do this in remembrance of him. I would like us to remember all that we have heard, have learned that Jesus did for us at the cost of Calvary and praise him for that tonight, amen. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift up this bread as the body of Jesus that was broken for us. Jesus gave his body for us so that we don't have to go through the consequence of what we do, our sins. Jesus paid the price. His body was broken so that we, our body can be made whole. He suffered every pain. He received a a crown of thorns so that you and I shall not have any mental illness, no headache. The side of Jesus was pierced, water and blood came out so that we should not suffer from any heartbroken when we trust in Jesus, when we crown him as king over our life. Jesus, by his stripes, we are here. We shall not suffer from any disease because Jesus took all the pain in his body for us already. Jesus, we thank you for paying the price that we owe. Thank you for the finished work of the cross. We thank you tonight as we partake into your body. May we remember you again as the Lord and Savior in every aspect of our life. Father, we thank you. We bless your name. 
as we partake in the body of Jesus tonight, we shall stand as children of God with boldness and defend what our faith is. Trusting Jesus all the way, no halfway, but all the way, because he did. He paid the price for every of our sin, past, present, and future. And he did this for the whole world, even for the one that don't know him yet. He deserves all the glory. He deserves all the honor. He deserves all the praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for the love, your love you manifested to us in your son. Jesus, we bless you tonight. We give you praise. And everybody say amen. Let us break and eat. For the blood, we are reading Luke 22, verse 20. He said, Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup, this is the new, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. The blood of Jesus was shed for us all, for every mankind. Let us pray as we lift up the cup. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the sacrifice your son did at the cross for us. When his body was broken and his blood was shed for us. And his blood has made a new covenant between us and you. We thank you, Jesus, for the blood of reconciliation. It's through your blood that we can enter the holiest of holy. They have communication with the Father. It's through your blood that we are forgiven, that we have been made whole, that we became a new creature. It's through your blood that we are hidden and the name you don't have access to us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for the blood of your son. That speak better things than the blood of Abel. That speak favor. That speak healing. That speak strength. That speak forgiveness and wholeness unto us. Jesus, we thank you. Father, we bless your name for the availability of the, the blood of your son that covers every aspect of our life. That speak on our favor, on our behalf, whatever we find ourselves. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus that is protecting us at the end of this year where so many things are happening. But Father God, because of the blood of Jesus, we are covered, we are protected. And our family also, even the one that don't know you, Lord, we thank you. Father, we bless you on it. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Let us drink. Amen. Amen. Okay, now we will go to the 10th chapter of uh, the book of Nehemiah. Yesterday, we finished uh, chapter 9 with uh, these verses. I want to read that. He said, uh, Nehemiah 9, 36 to 38. So now today, we are slaves in the land of plenty that we gave our ancestors for their enjoyment. We are slaves here in this good land. The lush produce of this land piles up in the hand of the king whom you have set over us because of our sin. They have power over us and our livestock. We serve them at their pleasure and we are in great misery. The people agree to obey. And they say the people responded, in view of all this, we are making a solemn promise and putting it in writing. On this sealed document are the name of our leaders and Levites and priests. 
So we notice that in chapter nine, we have seen how the people of God gather in fasting and in prayer. And they read the book of the law. And they pray also, reminding the Lord of uh, the sin of their ancestors, their own sin. And this we saw how uh, we saw how the children of Israel from the series of disobedience, black blasphemies, wrongdoing, and iniquity, the Lord God remained faithful. Therefore, in his love, keeps rescuing mankind, keep rescuing them. And we say, glory be to his name. So they want to make a vow to the Lord that they will now do the right thing. So that's what we are going to start saying in uh, chapter 10. Amen. So the people who seal the covenant, they are making new covenant with God. Those who place their seal on the document were Nehemiah the governor, the son of Hakaliah, and Zedekiah, Seriah, Azariah, Jeremiah, Pashur, Amaria, Maljika, Amalkija, Hatush, Jebaniah, Malush, Harim, Merimoth, Obadiah, Daniel, Ukinetan, Barush, Meshulam, Abijah, Mijamin, Maziah, Bilgai, and Shemaiah. These were the priests. From verse 9 to verse 13, we will see the name of the Levi who sealed the covenant. And from verse 14 to 27, the leaders of the people who sealed the covenant were also listed. There were a lot of names. So we just going to leave that one out. So we are going to see the covenant that was sealed. From verse 28, it say, now the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, and all those who had separated themselves from the people of the land to the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, everyone who had knowledge and understanding. These join if they are brethren, they are nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe, to do all the commandments of the Lord, our, our Lord, and his ordinances and his statutes. Amen. So this is this is a part of the law and uh, of the covenant, and we will see it. And this covenant is the same thing the law has given the children of Israel a long time ago. Verse thirty say, "We would not give our daughters as a wife to the people of the land, nor take their daughters for our sons. If the people of the land brought words or any grain to sell on the Sabbath day, we will not buy." eat from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day. And we will forego the seven years, the seven years produce and exacting of every debt. So they are telling God now that they are going to obey to his law. They even say that they will learn, they will let the land rest every seventh year and they will cancel every debt on to, uh, on to them. So every seven year, the land will rest and then they will cancel anything people owe them. I pray that by the grace of God, when we make covenant, when we make vow to the Lord with respect, because the Bible say, woe to whoever will make a vow and will not fulfill it. Amen. Verse 32. Also, we made ordinances for ourselves to exact from ourselves yearly one third of a shekel for the service of the house of the Lord. 33, for the showbread, for the regular grain offering, for the regular burnt offering of the Sabbath, the new moons and the set feast, for the holy things, for the sin offering to make atonement for Israel and all the work of the house of our God. When I got here, I know that today we, 
don't do services according to the show bread, regular grain offering or the regular burnt offering of the Sabbath or the new moon or the set uh, feast. But my question to us today is uh, how much do we offer when it comes to our time or our resources for the service of the house of the Lord? Because this offering are example of kingdom advancement. So I pray that we look into our life and see what we can sacrifice, what we can offer for the house of the Lord. Amen. 34, they say, uh, we cast the loss among the priests, the Levites, and the people for bringing the wood offering into the house of our God. According to our father's house, at the appointed times, year by year, and to burn on the altar of our uh, of the law, our God, as it is written in the law. Amen. There are many ways to keep the fire burning on the altar. Example: money due is one way. It's even like walking the pages of scripture. Keep the fire burning. Pray. That is one way. And which other way do we think we can keep the fire burning on the altar of the Lord? So I pray that we think about it and we find something we can do in the house of the Lord. Amen. Verse 35. And we made ordinances to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all fruits of all trees year by year to the house of the Lord to bring the firstborn of our son and our cattle, as it is written in the law, and the firstborn of our herd and our flocks to the house of the law, to the priests who minister in the house of our God. I saw that in Exodus 23 from verse 14 to 16, there are three annual feasts that the law wanted the Israelites to celebrate. The first one is called the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. And today, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread is the one that became Passover. And the Feast of the Harvest, that's the first fruit of our labor. And the Feast of uh, in gathering, that's the Feast of the End of the Year. That's oh. why they are the Jewish people do and they call it the Hanukkah. So we don't have to call it all this name, but uh, there, is, there are things we can do unto the Lord. Amen. We can celebrate the Passover every day. And we can say that we want to offer God our first fruit. It depends on whatever you do. Some people give a God their first month salary of the year. So there are many ways to advance the kingdom of God. Amen. Verse 37. To bring the first fruit to, of our dough, our offering, the fruit from all kinds of trees, the new wine and oil, to the priests, to the storm rooms of the house of our God, and to bring the tithes of our land to the Levite, for the Levite should receive the tithe in all our farming communities, and the priests. And uh, the priest, the descendant of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive tithe. And the Levites shall bring up a tent of the tithe to the house of our God, to the rooms of the storehouse. If we pay attention to here, verse 38 refers to the Leviticus tithe. Amen. And we know that we are tithing under the order for Melchizedek. Verse 39. For the children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of the grain, of the new wine and the oil to the store rooms where the article of the sanctuary are, where the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers are. We will not neglect the house of our God. This also refers to Nehemiah 13 verse 10 and 11. I say, I also realize that the portion for the Levites has not been given them. For each of the Levites and the singers who did the work had gone back to his field. This is not good. We don't want people 
that are serving in the house of the Lord to go back to the field. We want to be bringing our tithes. We want to be bringing our offering, our resources to help them so that they can keep the fire burning on the altar. Amen. 11 says, so I contended with the ruler said, why is the house of God forsaken? We should not forsake the house of God. And I gathered them together and set them in their place. So we need to remember this part of the scripture is not just an Old Testament thing. Is that giving to the house of the Lord is needed because that's how the people that are on the altar will survive so that the fire can keep can be kept burning. Amen. All right, that will be the end of chapter 10. Any contribution is welcome before we go to chapter 11. Amen. The floor is open. Um, I can share. This was on uh, verse 30 and 31. I forgot what slide it was on, but it talked about... Um, can you find it, Sister Coco, if you can? 30 and 31 to the next slide. Yeah, it talked about um, not giving your daughters and sons to the other people, you know, from the foreign land, as they called it. And then and also in verse 31, it talked about the importance of the Sabbath. Um, as I was, we'll definitely talk more about that as we get to chapter 12 and 13. But as I was reading chapter 12 and 13, I noticed the similarities of how a lot of the things were repeated. And so to me, that's just something that we should pay attention to, because typically in the Bible, when something's repeated more than once, it is something that we should be aware of and pay attention to. And so um, that's, I'll talk more about it when I, when I present chapter 13, as they talked a lot about this, but I just wanted to point it, point out that they spoke about it in depth in chapter 10. So it is something that we should be paying attention to as it is important. Amen. Thank you, Sister Malis. Uh, I don't know mm -hmm. if uh, we pay attention yesterday in, uh, I think in chapter eight, where Nehemiah was, uh, no, chapter seven, when Nehemiah was uh, listing everybody according to their genealogy and someone was not found. Tobiah who was the one giving Nehemiah trouble from day one. Yeah. And we saw also that he is an, an in-law of one of the priests. That's why he thought he can be doing whatever he was doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we don't know these people's genealogy, but the Lord told us, do not give your daughters as a wife to the people of the land. Do not take their daughters for your sons. Now that we went and we mingle with them, we find ourselves in this entanglement is how much Tobiah was bothering Nehemiah while Nehemiah was addressing God's kingdom. So let us be careful Amen. and spiritually. Let us pray that our children will not go and bring the child of the enemy to the house. That, that's what they want to marry. That's who they want to marry. Amen. Amen. Any, anybody? Amen. Um, just to add, um, just to add a little to what also stood out to me, I think around the last chapters, um, the way it talks about that we are like servant, right? We are like stewards. That we should, um, we should in this journey, right? We should know that, and we should have in mind our mindset that we are like stewards. And also whatever, um, like everything that he has given us, you know, the skill, the talents, the ability that he has given us, he has given us all the skill, the ability to use it in order to like advance his kingdom. And then as you were like saying about the giving, you know, how we have to give um, our offerings, our tithes. So, and uh, we have to give all of this back to, to, his, to, to, to his work, to, and in order to like give it to his work to advise his kingdom, I will also have to like generosity, like in order to bless others too. And uh, I think um, because he, God Himself, He was, I think He was, um, He was, um, 
he was a giver, you know, and the, we too, they said we should be a cheerful giver. So it's one of the, like, um, like when we are in a community, I want to take an example. Let's say if we are in a community, you know, like in a community, the, it's most often the only way we could really show our love, you know, is like show our love in our giving, our generosity, right? And there are so many ways that you could, you could give in a community to show the love of Christ. Just like I see there was, they had that, that trace in them. The children of the, they had that trace here that they could like give, like they were generous in their giving. So it's just some kind of like telling you and I that um, in today, um, in today, in today, we should also keep that same practice, the same way they were like doing, like most often in the community. But with the, this COVID thing, you know, um, there's a lot of changes that it has brought in a way that, you know, when you even go out to, to like do like a community work, everybody is like scared today. You want to give something to somebody, it's like, no, thank you, no, thank you. So it just, it makes it um, a way in a way that, you, I think you need the, the help of the Holy Spirit to really step out and do the work that previously, without the COVID, you could go and somebody could even open your open open his or her doors and welcome you inside. But the most often, you 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 remain at the door. It's just beating, beating, and they would even allow you to even come inside. Amen. So that stood out to me also. Amen. Thank you, Sister Miranda. That's true. There are many ways to offer something. And uh, we can also see how we get blessed in Psalm 42 when uh, you give to the needy. So we should not be scared of COVID and not do what we are supposed to do. If we see a member of our community in need and we have, let's share. Let's share. Let us advance the kingdom of God. That's what we know as children of God to give. Because mm -hmm. our father is an out giver. Amen. Mm -hmm. okay, if there is no more contribution, we will go to chapter 11. Chapter 11 is uh, going to be a lot of uh, name reading, but uh, if a good understanding. Amen. All right. Chapter 11, the people dwelling in Jerusalem. So we are going to see then chapter 11. There are some people that stay in Jerusalem and some people that were spread out in all Judea and Judah. Now the leaders of the people dwelt at Jerusalem. The rest of the people cast a lot to bring one out of 10 to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city. And nine tenth were to dwell in other cities. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. My question is to us is like, if it's our today and uh, we notice that we need to, some of us, 10% of us supposed to stay, uh, around the temple of the Lord and others can be spread to other city. Are we going to volunteer to stay close to the temple because we are there to keep God, we are there to serve, we are there to do God's work. How many of us will be willing to stay and do the work of God instead of leaving your own house Live in your own field and enjoy life. This is not easy. So we pray that when the call of God come upon our life, then we accept. Because if we don't are not doing the will of God, we can never live in peace. And at the end, we all have to give account. So I thank God for those that are willing to do the work of God. And when they cast the lot, if they had to cast the Lord, then they cast the Lord, then that Lord get on me. I pray that the Lord give me grace. 
And then, uh, you know, I, like, will, I will do his will. Leave behind my palace and go and live in his temple. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like when I was reading also, you know, like some a lot of them, you know, they left everything that they had, you know, those that have been established, right? Some okay. of them, they, 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 they left all those things. They said, no, they will go back. They obeyed their comfort zone, you know, they yeah. agreed to go back. So that it even stood out to me also. I was like, oh my goodness. So if they asked me to go like, you know, because it take, at the same time, it takes the grace of God and where you have established, you have everything. So you have to like, they ask you not to go back to, like assist in a different community or whatsoever. But I just, I love the, the, the grace and the strength over them. That's one of them that accepted. Without, they didn't like um, hesitate. They accepted willingly to go, as you are like saying. <laughs> yeah. Pray by the grace that you can leave the yeah. comfort zone. <laughs> Amen. Then to go to work for <laughs> all you have. Wow, well, may the Lord help us when that time comes. We, can, we should just get up and go and say, yes, Amen. here I am. Yeah, but we don't rebuke the voice that, no, 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 it's not. No, <laughs> no that's it's not, not him God talking. talking. That's not God, that's the devil. I rebuke him. That's the death. devil, yes. <laughs> oh, Lord. Amen. In verse 3 said, these are the head of the province who dwell in Jerusalem, but... In the cities of Judah, everyone dwelt in his own possession, in their cities, Israelites, priests, Levites, Nathanin, and descended of Solomon's servant. Also in Jerusalem dwelt some of the children of Judah and the children of Benjamin. So these names will be for the children of Judah. The children of Judah. Athiah, the son of Uzziah, the son of Zechariah, the son of Amariah, the son of Shephatiah, the son of Mahalel, Mahalalel, of the children of Perez, and Messiah, the son of Baruch, the son of Hosea, uh, the son of uh, Haziah, the son of Adiah, the son of Joarib, uh, the son of uh, Zechariah, the son of Shiloni, all the son of Perez who dwelt in Jerusalem were 468 violent men. Amen. And these are the son of Benjamin. For time's sake, we are not going to read all this name, but the nine say Joel, the son of Zikri, was their overseer, and Judah, the son of Senua was second over the city. I mean, these were the son of uh, Benjamin. Of the priests, Jediah, the son of uh, Joarib and Jakin, Zeruiah, the son of uh, Hilkiah, the son of Meshulam, the son of Zadok, the son of uh, Meriah, the son of Ahitub, was the leader of the house of God. Their brethren who did the work of the house were 842. And Adiah, the son of Jeroah, the son of Pelalia, the son of Amzi, the son of Zachariah, the son of Pasho, and the son of Malkijah, and his brethren, heads of the father's house, were 242. And Amshaya, the son of Azariah, the son of Azhai, Ahzai, the son of um, Meshilema, the son of Aimer, and their brethren, mighty men of Velo, were 128. Their overseer was Zabdiel, the son of one of the great men. Amen. And also all these people will be the Levites. And they were also doing the work of God. Uh, let me read uh, verse 18 that says, All the Levites in the holy city were 284. Moreover, the gatekeepers, Akub, Talmon, and their brethren who kept the gate were 172. And the rest of uh, Israel, of the priests and Levites, were in all the city of Judah. 
everyone in his inheritance. But the Nathan, Nathan dwell in Ophel and Giza and Gishpa were over the Nathan. Amen. Okay, next will be from uh, chapter 21. Okay. I'll tell you too. It says, also the overseers of the Levite at Jerusalem was uh, Uzi, the son of Bani, the son of uh, Ashabiah, the son of Matania, the son of Micah, of the son of Asaph, the singers in charge of the service of the house of God. For it was the king's command concerning them that a certain portion should be for the singers, a quota day by day. Etahiah, the son of Meshizabel, of the children of Zerah, the son of Judah, was the king's deputy in all matters concerning the people. And I like how they are mentioning the king here. So they had the hand of God upon them till even the king has something to do with them. But they are good enough, the wrong one, amen. So now we are going to talk about the people dwelling outside of Jerusalem. And as for the villages with their fear, some of the children of Judah dwell in Kilja, Arba, and its villages. Zibon and its villages, Jekazbazil and its village, in Geshua, Moladad, Beth Pelech, Azashul, and Beersheba, and its villages, in Ziklag and uh, Mekona and its villages in An Rimon, Zora, Shamot, and Zanoa, Adulam, and their villages in, Lash, in Lakish and its field in Azeka and its villages. They dwell from Beersheba to the valley of uh, Hinnom. Amen. Verse 31, also the children of Benjamin from uh, Geba dwelt in Mishmak, Mikmash, Aija, and Bethel, and their villages. In Anathoth, Nob, Anania, in Hazor, Ramah, Gitem, in Hadid, Zibon, Zibalat, in Lord Ono, and the Valley of Craftsmen. Some of the Judean division of the Levites were in Benjamin. Amen. So if all the name of the son of the sons and the name of the villages, that's where they lived. So that's what chapter 11 was talking about. And that's clear. We just cannot spell all those names well <laughs> or pronounce them well. But that's... Uh, how they were spread out in Jerusalem and Judah. Amen. Anybody has anything to say concerning chapter 11, besides the fact that they had to cast a lot for people, 10% uh, of the people to stay in uh, Jerusalem and 90% can stay in their comfort zone. Amen. Yes, and actually, I'll just like the this um, eleven. When I was reading it, right, as I earlier said about they were casting the lot for those who are willing to and those who are not willing to. Even though some of them they they, they really like they volunteer right to go back to review the the walls of the community, and at the same time, one thing that stood out to me, you know, like this um. When we are seeking the face of God, we are seeking the face of God, not only to benefit God, but to benefit others around us, because we are like a body of Christ. And uh, we also know that the Bible says um, we are the light of the world and we are the salt of the earth. So like on this race, at the same time, and where you accept to, to, do, to do his work, right? 
wherever, just be open, just have an open mind that wherever he sends you, right, you are willing to go. Because okay. most often, to be in a, there's a lot of sacrifice if you're like a leader. There's a lot of sacrifice that you have to do. And those are one of the things that will ask you to go somewhere that you don't even want to. But just because of the fact that you are seeking the face of God in order to bless others, not just God, you are like, wherever he asks you to go, you go. That's something that's to the knowing that we are the light of the world. So we are, we are like, we have to like accept to go wherever we go to show that light to benefit the others that in the community. So that's something that leads to that to me. Amen. Thank you, mm -hmm. Mr. Miranda. That's really important. Yeah, and we also have to remember whatever the Lord send you, he'll provide. Amen. That's true. That said, go, leave everything behind. He is a faithful God. Whatever he, he will do, he always does it. Amen. Amen. Yeah, Sorry, because I... we are called and empowered by the, he, he calls us and he empowers us, as you rightly said, it. that's true. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Amen. I, I wanted to add to, to what Sister Miranda was saying earlier. It reminds me of this, uh, the verse, I might be paraphrasing it or not quoting it um, verbatim, but the verse where it says that no one that, that puts their hands to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and, and so it reminds me of that because these men in verse two, they were willingly um, offering themselves, you know, to dwell at Jerusalem. And so in order to be willingly able to offer yourself means that you understand what, what sacrifices comes with that. And, you know, they, they didn't look back. They fully went ahead and did what they um, promised to do. So it's really important that kind of like that scripture that when we, we, we say that we're going to do something to advance God's kingdom, that we aren't 50-50, that we either commit and do it fully, or if we don't commit mm -hmm. and do it we were better off, you know, not doing anything at all, that we should be diligent and, and diligent in the things that we do and also make those commitments to fulfill it, to see it to completion. Amen. And I just Amen. even think about Nehemiah, just the whole, you know, the whole book of the story. Nehemiah was a great example at this. He came to build the wall and do a task that has been sent there for a really long time. And he was diligent to complete it. You know, I'm sure every single day, because it, it took them 52 days, as we, we talked about in the previous weeks. And so they could have e easily gotten weary with the net those 52 days. You know, Nehemiah had a lot of distractions from Tobiah and all these people trying to lie against him and, and, pull him away from the task but he was diligent and he did not allow distractions to pull him away from what he promised to do and you know was faithful to do so um i think that that whole book really talk, really talks about his consistency and that de dedication to the work of the lord amen amen thank you sister marlies for your addition or your addition made sense because when we uh, we accept to follow the lord command and instruction we have to know that it's not just for us other mm -hmm. people are going to be impacted and affected so when we start let's be faithful and finish mm -hmm. and we finish mm -hmm. okay. well. and, and we we also see that they talked about the, the, the you know it's like Oh, they were they, they were heading to Jerusalem, and I think that's where all of us. I think we are all like um, they said. Um, as Jesus is returning, he's going to return to Jerusalem. Like that's where it's like we, all of us. We are. It's a dream, right? The new Jerusalem, and the, just like um, to, in order for us to like um, in order for us to to migrate to this. New, this new uh, Jerusalem, I want to believe that also um, our desires, right? Because I want to believe that some of those people that they, they, they were not like willing to go is because of maybe they have their desires. So with, the, with your desires within you at times, it's so difficult to let go those desires, right? So you have to forgo those desires in order to, you know, in, you have to forgo those desires in order to answer the will of God in order to head to the, the new Jerusalem. So one of our desire, I think most of it is the greater, is the, one of the greatest things that is like an obstacle to us when we look at it. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
If there is no more addition, then the floor is open for Sister Malay to bring in a, a chapter, yeah, uh, chapter 12 and 13. Amen. So I'll stop sharing so she can share her slide. Over to you, Sister Manis. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Sister Coco, for leading the first half of the readings. And so, as you said, I will continue the remainder, which is going to be chapter 12 and um, 13. And so if, just for sake of time, I'm not going to read the whole chapter um, as it was a little lengthy, but hopefully, you know, we'll take the time to read it on our own so that the Lord can bless us uh, with more understanding. And so um, I'm just going to read the different verses that uh, stood out to me in my notes. And so as we read the first few verses of Nehemiah chapter 12, we noticed that from verse 1 to 21, it talked about the different um, priestly priestly families. It mentioned the priestly family of Levites, and they listed all of them out according to basically like a genealogy order of all the priests around that time. Um, but something that really stood out to me was verse 8. Verse 8 was really um, just, I don't know, stood out to me, and I'll read it to you all. It says the Levites were, were Jeshua, Benu, Kadimel, Sherebiah, Judah, and also Mataniah, who together with his associates was in charge of the songs of thanksgiving. And so I just really want to highlight the other part, who together with his associates were in charge of the songs of thanksgiving. And so that part really stood out to me because they mentioned that this family was in charge of worship. You know, they were worshiping unto the Lord. And so it stood out to me because I thought about that. It reminded me of the body of Christ. And Sister Miranda talked about that too, where, um, I'm sorry, no, talked about uh, you know, what, what a family is in charge of. And so I thought of, I, I thought about my family and our family, you know, what is our family in charge of in, in advancing God's kingdom? Um, kind of like the question Sister Coco asked earlier, what are different ways that we advance God's kingdom? And as a family, we should be striving to do that, you know, whether it's by prayers, fasting, or taking out time that we're donating and offering our time to not just the church, but also to the body, which is those that are around us, you know, those that are suffering. And so I just thought that was really important to highlight because as you see, this family was in charge of praising God and worshiping him. And so we need to make sure that we also have an area that we are in charge of in our family so that we, we are actively advancing God's kingdom together. And then so in verse 24, I'll read as the leaders of the Levites were Hashabiah, Serebiah, Jeshua, son of Kadimael, and their associates who stood opposite them to give praise and thanksgiving one section responding to the other as prescribed by David, the man of God. And so this, again, this part stood out to me because I liked how it said, who stood opposite them to give praise and thanksgiving, one section responding to the other. And so that part where it says one section responding to the other, it made me think about the structure of the body, where as the body of Christ, we each have our own sections, our own talents, gifts, things that we're supposed to use to advance God's kingdom. And, you know, just like a body, how it functions, we need our parts to respond to one another. For example, if you wanted to walk and you told your left leg to go left and you told your right leg to go right, they're not in unison with one another. They're not responding to each other. And so in order for the body to progress in walking, they need to respond to one another. The left leg has to be in agreement with the right leg so that way you can properly walk ahead or wherever you're going. And so again, going back to the body of Christ, if we are if we're not all um, focusing on the special specializations that we have, you know, one person's job might be teaching, one person's job might be um, singing or praising or whatever the case might be giving encouragement. It's important that we, we know what our roles are and that we don't try to be the next person, but that we are diligent in the roles and the gifts that God has given us. So that way we're responding towards with one another, because that's how God gives the glory. You know, what good would it be, be if everyone was the teacher in the body of Christ and who would be the evangelist and who would be uh, the, the pastors, who would be praying if everyone did the exact same role? I don't think we'll really advance God's kingdom that much if we're all doing one task. And I think that's why God made us all fearfully and wonderfully made. And we're all unique because he put gifts in each and every one of us where he wants us to use those gifts to glorify him. And so um, moving on. Actually, yeah, 
Another thing I wanted to note was how they responded to David. It says, as prescribed by David, the man of God. And so that was important because they responded to David. David at that time was, you know, their leader. And I think about just church and how important it is for us to respond to men and women of God in our lives, that we don't take their advice for granted, but that we are seeking those advice so that way we can respond to them. And then there's this uh, verse, I think, I don't know, I think it's from Luke, if I'm if I'm correct, or yeah, I'll have to find it, but it's, it's from somewhere like that. But it talks about, you know, when God speaks to his men or women of God, he's that's his voice that he's using through them to speak to us. And if we disobey that voice, we in essence disobey God. And so it's really important that we are not disobeying our men of God because God put them in those positions of leadership. And so if we dis disobey them, then we in essence disobey God. Kind of like Jesus, if we reject Jesus, we reject God because God sent Jesus here for us. And so whatever Jesus says is the word of God. And so I thought it was really important how David was giving them instructions and they were obedient to follow those instructions. And so going on to verse five, sorry, verse 25, it says, uh, Mataniah, Bakuya, Bakaya, and Obadiah, Musalam, Talon, Talon, and Akab were gatekeepers who guarded the storerooms at the gates. And so, um, you know, as we mentioned here, storerooms, the storerooms are basically an area where you stored contributions, first offerings, tithes, you know, really important things were kept in that storeroom. And these people were guarding those storerooms. They sit at the gate guarding it from maybe people who wanted to steal, people who didn't have the right intention. So they needed to be a guard there. They understood the specialization of labor where each person was assigned to a role to play. I kind of alluded to that earlier where we talked about being a body of Christ. We all have gifts, we all have roles, and we should, you know, be diligent in those roles that we have um, to play because we contribute to the greater um, good of God's kingdom where we can advance it properly. And so um, so I mentioned I mentioned the storehouse because it lets us know that we must to guard the secret things in our lives, the things that God has entrusted us on, we need to guard it. You know, the scripture where it says in, in the New Testament, it said that don't cast your pearls to pigs, meaning that pearls are sacred. That is a sacred thing. If we cast it to anybody, what is, we lose the, the secretness of that thing. And so you know, them guarding the storehouse, they knew how secret that storehouse was. So they, they had guard over it. And so we should, we should also guard the secret things in our lives. We should guard the things that God has given us and be good stores to those things as well. You know, whether it's the tithe that we guard, we guard those things from evil forces. We protect our tithes um, or protect our income and our finances that God has given us by using it properly to advance his kingdom. You know, we shouldn't be bad stewards of our income and our finances where we get money, we spend money, we get, you know, like that continuous repetition where we're not thinking about saving, thinking about that rainy day, but we're only concerned about spending what we make. That is not being good stewards of what God has given us. And so that part stood out to me because I also, it's really important that we guard our storehouses, you know, which is our finances, our families, whatever that secret thing is to you, we need to be, we need to be diligent in being good stewards of that thing. Um, okay, so moving on to verse uh, 27, this is where the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem was happening. And so in 27, at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought out from where they lived and where and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully the dedication with songs of thanksgiving and with music of chimbles, harps, and lairs. And so this was, I don't know, like I kept reading this verse and I was like, okay, like what is the importance of this? I, I didn't understand what God wanted me to get, but it just for sec it just took me by pause. I had to pause and reread it, reread it. And so something that stood out to me was that the Levites were sought out. You know, the sought out means that they went to find the Levites. They had to go locate who they were. So they went around to the cities looking for, okay, who's a Levite, who's not a Levite, because they knew that they had to bring them to the celebration of the wall being dedicated. And so to me, that was important because, you know, it reminds me of being like Christ, right? Are we, are we able to tell 
are people able to tell that we're quote unquote a Levite? Back in the days, because the Levites, they were the, the priestly lineage, people were able to recognize the Levites from non-Levites. And so with us today, what, what can people recognize us as? Do we look like children of God? Are we ambassadors of Christ? Can people recognize us when they come to look for Christians? When it comes to our jobs to look for, oh, where's a Christian here that can pray for me? Would you be recognized by that person? You know, when they come to, I don't know, uh, anywhere out in, out in the street, they're looking for Christians. Are we going to be amongst those people that are sought out because we're recognized as children of God or are we not? Um, that's kind of like what stood out to me because they had to go find these people. You know, they knew who was who Levites were. They knew who weren't Levites. And how did they know that? Because of the customs, because of the same ideology. I think of in, in the New Testament where, where Peter, you know, was a great example of this. I remember when he betrayed Jesus, the reason he was spot out that people knew he was a, a disciple was because of how his, he spoke. He didn't look like everyone around him. His verbiage, although, you know, Peter had his moments and he wasn't as consistent and he just, and he, um, rejected Christ three times, you know, and denied him. But still something that stood out about Peter was that he was different. That is how the people around the campfire, when they were, you know, saying that, aren't you the guy that hangs out with Jesus? And he said, no, he said no three times. But the reason that they can tell Peter was a disciple was because of his actions, how he spoke, how he, everything was different about him because he had been walking with God, you know, so can, can people tell that we're walking with Christ? Are we different from the world? Do we speak different? Do we look different? Do we act different? Um, so that was just something that stood out to me because when someone comes to seek us out, will they recognize us for who we are or would we look just like everyone else? Um, okay, so moving on to 30 and 31, it says when the priests and the Levites had purified themselves ceremon ceremonially, they purified the people at the gates, they purified the people, the gates and the walls. I had the leaders of Judah go up on foot, go up on top of the wall. I also assigned two large choirs to go give things. One of them proceeded on top of the wall to the right towards the, du the dung gate. And so I wrote here because it was so cool how they were going to do a ceremony because of what the Lord had done for them. And so it's really important that we are not ignoring the things that God does for us, but that we give God praise. We go back and celebrate his goodness and, and give God blessings for what he has done for us. You know, during the ceremony, they bless the gates. I just talked about the, they bless the gates and the walls. And so it just means that giving God thanks to the things that he's enabled us to complete in our lives. And so in morning dew today, we prayed about you know, things coming to completion. Whereas if we had a goal set for the new year's and we feel like it hasn't come to pass yet, we should thank God already for the things that he has enabled us to complete. And the things that are yet to, to be accomplished, we thank God in advance because we know that he's working in our favor. And so it's really important that when God does something for us, just like these people, they held a ceremony, they held a, a, a praise session for God because they wanted to give him things. It says that two large choirs to give things. So they literally had, had such a great um a great assembly of of giving praise to God you know what are the things that God has done in our lives and we since we forgot to thank him because maybe we didn't realize he did it or we just got so busy with our lives that giving thanks wasn't a priority you know so it's really important that we get we go back and look at this year that just passed you know give God things that he got us through COVID give God things that you know hopefully we still have a job we still have finances we're still alive we have health give God thanks for the little things because those little things are not what everyone has. Not everyone is alive today. Not everyone has family. You know, not everyone has the things that we're so blessed and fortunate to have. So just like how uh, the, the Levites and, and the priests and all these people, they went back to give God thanks for something that he allowed them to accomplish. We need to do that too in our lives and go back and thank God for those things as well. And so, um, well, I'll, I'll just leave the floor open before I, I finish at the last few um, verses, just in case anyone has any comments to, to add before it gets too much and overwhelming. So any, any additions that anyone would like to add? Yes, I wanted to add something. Uh, when uh, you spoke about verse 8 and verse 24 concerning uh, the song of Thanksgiving that certain family were given, they were responsible of the yeah. They were ch in charge of this song of thanksgiving, and also you mentioned part of it. People that were doing the praise and thanksgiving in verse twenty four. 
personally, I was asked uh, this question last week. What is my family assignment? This is very, very important for us to know as children of God. It means what part, what role do you play in the kingdom of God? That is the question. What do you think your family is supposed to be doing as an assignment that the Lord gave you? So this is very important for us to know. Amen. Very, very important. This is why these people, they were able to tell their assignment. Amen. Amen. Also, where you want to say something? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, where we were talking about the, the one that were in charge of the storerooms, what came to mind is uh, Luke 16, verse 10. Whoever is faithful with very little also uh, will also be faithful with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So these people, for them to be found to be the one to, uh, the gatekeepers who gathered the storm rooms at the gate is because they were found faithful. Yeah, because in those storm rooms, there are goods that people bring. They must, they, they were found trustworthy for them to be in charge of the storm room. So I pray that we learn faithfulness from God, honesty. So that one day when they are looking for trustworthy people, they can find them in the body of Christ and now outside of the body. Amen. 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 Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Sister Coco. I definitely love what you um, added um, regarding the first one. It's really important that we know what our roles are in our families. And also, it's, I think it starts as individuals, right? Because God made us all individuals to play a part in the body. And so when we know our purpose and we know the roles that we play, there's no confusion. And I think that's why Nehemiah was able to build the wall at such a fast rate. 52 days might seem like a lot, but it, it can take years to build that wall. And so I think he was able, yes, he had favor with God, but he knew exactly what he was sent to do. And because of that, he was so focused. Even when people try to distract him and Tobiah, they said, come down from the wall. He knew exactly what he needed to do and he had tunnel vision. And so I think when we know the roles that God has called us to, to, um, to do in his kingdom, it allows us to be more focused and avoid distractions, right? Yeah. Amen. 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 Miranda. Um. Well, sorry. Well, no, um. Okay. I wanted to say that yes. Uh, also, we can also see that you know it's like um, like in most of the chapters we do see that we have a list, right? You know, to me this list I do is very important. You know, it's like they have a list, a very very long list that either they will put the list is is like an account. They give like an account of this these people that accepted to. So it's just like, it's like ministering to you and us that, you know, it's like despite the fact that with all that was going, with all the tribulation, with all the whatever, you know, the word of God, right? It never stopped. Mm -hmm. The word of God was still continuing. They continued in the word of God. So this is like, it, 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 that's why I say it stood out to me the sense that despite the, the challenges that we go through, we should never at one point think that um, we'll have to like, stop doing the work of God. The work of God has to push ahead, just like we see with them. The brother, like the list, like they, I said, they, I, they, talk, they brought out the list of the, the ministers of God. They list them all out. And then also something that, um, then and the, the, at one point, they always talk about the, the, those that the, the followers, those that were the, like the people that were the followers, the ones that they were following, the ones that are accepted to give the, the, their life to. Because actually, we know we live in a society that not everybody will want to be, not everybody will want to submit, but you mm -hmm. also have the ones that they want to submit and they want to follow to make sure that, um, to make sure that the, the work of God continues to go ahead. And also, um, I also, their beliefs, also something that stood out of me from the way you are reading from that, I think there's one right up to 20 something. You know, um, it talks, uh, you know, the, they are believed also, they, they kept to the, 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 the promises and the, you know, they kept the, the, the promises, they kept the promises and the, what they had agreed to do on. 
that 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 promise to Nehemiah to do to do that they will not break the law or whatsoever. They, they kept to those promises, but at the same time they kept uh, like the word of God. They kept to the word of God also, and at the same time, they, I think the only thing that they they were like looking for like um you know because at one point they had they they had skills they had like um different potentials on how to do things right, but I think the only thing that could change in this sense was like um. You know, at times, you know, like they said, um, like on the platform now, um, if you see Pastor Midrad now, they are trying to bring different skills to apply, but it's still the same thing. It's still, it's still focused on the word of God, but they are trying to bring in different skills or different, um, um, how to like, um, different strategy or whatsoever that we could use. They, they, they too, they have the same thing with them. And uh, also, you did talk about um, is it the dedication? That's about me also in the sense that I really liked it because um, they were not really like um, I think they were not really like into the gift, the, the, the gifts, right? They were like really pouring out their heart to the giver because I most often they said um, we should not um, like most often people care about the hand, people care about the gift, the, the gift, not the giver. Mm -hmm. But to so this, um, when you look at them. The way they were uh, they were doing the dedication, rejoicing the thanksgiving is like they were really like giving it to the looking, giving it to the giver, and not um, they were not really like the gift. They they focused on appreciating and rejoicing and thanking him, thanking the giver. So that's something that also stood out to me, as you like you said about the the, the 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 prayer points that we're having. The three this thing that they said this morning that even if we have not had it right. But we are still appreciating the giver. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. So, those are some things that stood out to me. Amen. Thanks for sharing, Sister Miranda. Um, and speaking of giving or giving things, uh, I, I just actually, as you all were speaking, I remembered in verse 31 that it reminded me of, I, I was thinking of like, you know, who were people that came back to give things to God? And I think of in the New Testament, the story of the 10 lepers, when God healed all 10 of them, only one person one. came to give things. Mm -hmm. God said, where, where are the other nine? Where, where are they? Weren't they healed as well? And he said, you know, no, I'm, I'm here by myself to give things. And so God, Jesus was pleased with that one person, you know, and because of that, he blessed and, and he healed him. And so that just shows that Jesus wants us to give things to him. And he does pay attention. You know, he said, okay, I did this thing for my daughter. She's been bugging me for it, uh, bugging me for it for a few months now, now that I did it for her has she come back to thank me have we went back to give God the praise and the glory for whatever we have been you know praying and toiling for mm -hmm. and so I thought of that you know it's really cool how the, that one person he came back to give things and so we should be that one leper who comes back not that we have leprosy but we should be back that that be that one person follow his examples when we come back and give God things even for the little things you know like waking us up that is a huge miracle that we should give God things for on a daily basis Amen. 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 And so moving on to verse uh, 36, and it says, as his associates, Shemaya, let me highlight it. Shemaya, Ma Malia, Malia, Galia, Maya, Nathan, Nathaniel, Judah, and Hananiah with musical instruments prescribed by David. The man of God, Ezra, the teacher of the law, led the procession. Procession, sorry. And so the celebration procession was led by Ezra. The people didn't do things out of order, but then they submitted to leadership. And kind of like what I spoke about earlier, as far as how they listened to David, um, here is also Ezra seen leading this pro procession of worshiping God. And so it talks about order, it talks about structure, and it also talks about it being submitted to a leadership. And so. Um, you know, the same should definitely apply to us when we're advancing God's kingdom. We should make sure that we're sent, that we are sent by God and God leads us, that we're successful when we go in. Because when we do things on our own, then we don't really find a lot of success because we're 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 the ones that's making everything come to pass. But just like how these people submitted to Ezra and his leading, we need to submit to the Holy Spirit and his leading as well. Um, because advancing God's kingdom will take some uh 
will take being, um, oh my gosh, strategic, will take us being strategic. Whereas we're not just doing things out of random. We're just not talking to any random person or saying what any random thing that comes to mind, but that we're asking God for wisdom, for clarity, for discernment. So that way we speak the things of God. And when we do the things God's way, he'll be the one to open up the doors and give us favor like he did with Nehemiah because God sent Nehemiah to build the wall. God gave him favor. He opened up doors for him. And I think, honestly, if you think about, think back to why the wall wasn't built was because these people were trying to build it on their own strength. That's why they never got it accomplished because God did not send them to build the wall. And when he sent Nehemiah, it only took 52 days. You know, and I, and we reference the scripture where in, in Psalms, in Psalms 126, where it says that unless the Lord builds the building, the labors labor in vain. So if God doesn't send us there, then we're going to labor in vain. But if God is for us, who can be against us? You know, because he'll literally open up the doors and pave the way for us. So it's important that when we're advancing God's kingdom, we seek God first before we move and we ask him, okay, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? And how do you want me to do it? Because he'll lead us when we're submitted under his will and his leadership. And so moving on to 40 to 42, it says the two choirs that gave thanks then took their place in the house of the Lord, the house of God. So did I, together with half the officials, as well as the priests, Elakim, Mishiah, Menamin, Micaiah, Eloniah, Zechariah, and Hananiah with their trumpets. And also with Mashiach, Semiah, Eliezer, Uzi, Uzi, Johan, Mikaja, Elam, and Ezra, the choir sang, the choir sung under the direction of Jeremiah. And so again, here is where people, it, it shows us people knew the importance of continuously praising God. Um, as you see, the praise just keeps adding on. You know, there's people who are playing the trumpets. There's people who are um, the choir. There's many people are doing different things and playing different instruments. And so it just shows that they understood the importance of how it is, how important it is to praise God and that we should always have continuous praises on our lips and always give God thanks. And so verse uh, 43, on that day, they offered great sacrifices, rejoicing because God had given them great joy. The women and the children also rejoiced. The sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. And so again, we should always praise God. We should praise him so much that others can hear us praise God because praising is a kingdom advancement strategy. It is a kingdom advancement tool. Kind of like in, in morning dew, we share our testimonies, not just because we're trying to brag, but we share it so that way we can give God the glory. And when others hear about your good news and how God has blessed you, it strengthens others because now others have faith that while wow, God is alive and God is actually working in my sister or brother's life, therefore he can work and do the same thing in my life. And so it's important that we're rejoicing because it says that the sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem can be heard far away. And so the, the rejoicing was a witness. It was a testimony that other people, I'm sure they were curious, like what's going on in Jerusalem? Why are people singing and so happy? And I, I'm sure, you know, random people passed over. Like if you're African, you have a party, <laughs> people are just going to show up whether they're invited or not. And I can imagine this happening where they were having this huge celebration. They were dancing and singing and just lots of loud music and clapping. And others that didn't live in Jerusalem, they heard that joyful noise and they were curious to see why are these people so happy? What's going on? And I'm sure that they drove over and then they asked, what's going on? What's going on? And that was an opportunity that the people can use to witness and give God glory and advance his kingdom. You know, tell, tell them like, wow, God built this wall in 52 days and he gave us favor, et cetera. And so it's really important that, again, our praises are really important, not just to God, but to, to how we advance God's kingdom, because we remind him that he is faithful. And we also remind others that he is still working and he can do that the same thing on their behalf as well. And so um, moving on to verse 43. Okay, I already read that. Yeah, I already talked about that. Um, so we'll go on to 44 to 47. It says at that time, men were appointed to be in charge of the storerooms for their contributions, first fruits and tithes. So basically it tells us what is stored in the, in the storeroom. It says contributions are stored, first fruits and also tithes, as we talked about earlier. 
From the fields around the towns, they were to bring into the storerooms the portions required by the law for the priests and the Levites, for Judah was pleased with the ministering priests and Levites. They performed the service of their God and the service of purification, as did also the music musicians and gatekeepers, according to the commands of David and his son Solomon. For long ago in the days of David and Aspa, there had been directors for the musicians and the songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. So in the day of Zerubbabel and of Nehemiah, all Israel contributed to contributed the daily portions for the musicians and the gatekeepers. They also set aside the portion for the other Levites and the Levites set aside the portion for the descendants of Aaron. And so here it talks about, you know, tithing other under the order of Melchizedek, sorry, the order of the Levite, Levitical priesthood. But as Sister Coco mentioned earlier, we're no longer under that um, priesthood order. We're now under the order of Melchizedek where we tithe because we're blessed. We give back to God to say thank you for him, for all that he's done for us. And so just also as I'm reading this, I see again, submission, you know, the people submitted to David and his son Solomon. They understood the importance of leadership and, you know, what submission can do. Everyone had somebody that was directing them, whether it was the musicians, the guards, everyone had somebody that they submitted to. And so as believers, in order to properly submit God's kingdom, we need wise counsel. And it's important that we go to people that are trusted and we know that are of the Lord. And so another thing, as I, I wanted to mention, Sister Coco uh, talked about this already, where it says that at the time, the men were appointed to be in charge of the storerooms for the contributions. These men weren't cho chosen at random. They were appointed, meaning that they had to consider, OK, who are we going to allow to guard these things? Because you don't just want anyone guarding your storeroom. You, you know, this is where they had contributions, the first fruits tithe. The store rooms were filled with a lot of money, a lot of wealth. And so if you just appointed anybody, then you'll be making a mistake, you know? So these men were carefully sought out. They were carefully appointed because they saw them as responsible. They saw them as men that were trustworthy in order to guard the storeroom. And so I think about us again and just being good stewards, you know, can God entrust us with, with riches? Can he entrust us, entrust us with different things that we can properly steward? And I think of just the example in the, um, the New Testament of the talents where God gave each person according to his ability. God is not going to give you a million dollars if you can barely handle a hundred dollars because he knows that if you cannot store it a hundred, how can we store it a million dollars? And so it's really important that we're faithful with what God has given us and we're properly storing it because God chooses those that he wants to appoint because of how they can handle what he's given them already. And so if, for example, God is calling someone to, you know, teach and be a leader, how are we leading in our household? You know, it starts with those little things. Who has God given us leadership over? If you're a parent, how are you properly, are you a good example for your kids? Are you setting those right examples? You know, how are you speaking to your kids? How are you living? Because kids, they don't, they don't really hear what you say all the time. I have, you know, nieces and nephews, a lot of them. So I know that they follow you by example. So some of the things that kids will see you doing, they start to copy and, em and emulate those things because what you do matters and what you do affects how other people react. And so it's really important that we start to store the positions that we're in for God to uplift us. You know, whether we're hoping for a promotion, how are we currently distorting our roles I know I'm guilty of that because with my job it's just been uh, too much <laughs> but you know that that's just conviction that we could know like okay in order for God to elevate us we need to be diligent in the roles and the places that he's put us in okay so that is the last of uh chapter 12 so I will leave any comments before we, we move on to the last chapter Amen. Thank you, Sister Malis, for this part again. What stood out to, to me was the praise, how the praise was so loud. I pray that our life shall be a life of uh, high thanksgiving and praise because it's truly a, a tool of a kingdom's advancement. A lot of people will say, why do you always praise God for a little thing, for everything? You know, And they will be like, who is that kind of God for you? And they'll start asking questions. I don't know then if they know how to evangelize, but today is our job to evangelize. So praising God is like a evangelic uh, evangelism tool 
and at the same time, kingdom advancement too. It's very mm -hmm. important. I really, really I like that. May we pray so that the neighbor say, what's going on in that house and come and see. <laughs> and we tell them, <laughs> come and see what the Lord has done. <laughs> Ask about our God. Thank you. I love that part a lot. Any other comments? Sister Perdita and Sister Didi, you guys have been quiet today. And Sister Desiree, any comments from you ladies? It's just that they did no comment. I'm following you and I'm making a note of all those that you were saying. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, if there aren't any other comments, then we will move on to the last chapter, which is chapter 13. And like I said, again, for sake of time, we're not going to read the whole um, verse by verse, but we'll just kind of point out, lift that out. What's this chapter 13? Okay, so in chapter 13, verse uh, 1 and 2, it says, On the day the book of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of the people, and there it was found written that no Ammonite, Ormonite, and Moabite should ever be admitted into the assembly of God because they had not met the Israelites with food and water, but had hired Balaam, Balaam to call a curse down on them. Our God, however, turned the curse into a blessing. Amen. And so it just reminds me of no weapons formed against us shall prosper. You know, when we find ourselves in danger, God is always faithful to protect us from all and any harm. And so this is basically what he did for them when these people cursed, you know, Moses, uh, sorry, when they cursed them, they, yeah, they had a curse on them, but God turned it around. He turned the curse and made it into a blessing. And so I love how God would turn a situation around and make it favorable. What man made for, meant for evil, God turned it around and used it for our good. Amen. And so in verse uh, four and five, before this, Eliza, the priest, had put had been put in charge of the storerooms, had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of God. He was closely associated with Tobiah. And he and he had provided him with a large room formerly used to store the grain offerings and the incense and temple articles and also the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil prescribed for the Levites, musicians, and gatekeepers, as well as the contributions for the priests. And so here, as we talked about um, in the previous uh, chapter, that it's really important that we choose the right, we 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 guard our storehouse. We just don't, you know, back then in the old chapter, they just didn't appoint anybody to guard the storehouse because they knew the importance of it. But here we see that that wasn't honored because Eliza, Eliza, because Tobiah was, you know, closely related to him, he just allowed Tobiah to go and basically sin and just live in the storehouse when he wasn't supposed to. And this is what bad stewardship looks like because when we allow anybody to in our storehouse, we risk sinning against God and making a mistake. And so it's really important that we are careful um, to, you know, careful to, to be diligent and selective of the people that we put in our lives. And so here again, I know we've been talking a lot about the connection. I think Sister Coco mentioned that where Tobiah was connected, beat that, you know, to this priest, which is why he was able to use use basically take advantage of him in, in a way and then do evil and I don't think that this man knew he was being taken advantage of but from looking at it he definitely was because you know this uh Elijah Elisa provided Tobias to live in in the storeroom which he knew that he was a priest so he knew that this was not right this was not lawful you know you couldn't be living there unless you were a priest which was a levite and all that but because tobiah maybe manipulated him because he was as we read from the i think chapter two and three tobiah is very conv convincing he's like satan who's so cunning he's really persistent so i'm sure he you know deceived this man to allow him to live in the storehouse so we, we need to guard ourselves and be careful with the people that we allow to speak into our lives and who we get advice from because it can get us in trouble if, if it's the wrong people we're listening to. 
Um, in verse eight, it says, I was greatly displeased and threw all of Tobiah's household goods out of Jerome. So background, this is when Nehemiah knew that Tobiah was living in the storehouse. So Nehemiah came after he found out because he wasn't around at that time. So he came, he was so displeased, he was so angry, and he threw out of he threw Tobiah's goods out of the room. And so Nehemiah, I just really like his character. He's very bold. I think Nehemiah, because he knew who he was, he didn't play games. Like he was very strict on what the Lord had said. He was really diligent to obey God and did not compromise on anything, no matter who it was or whatever. He did not compromise. And so he threw Tobias out of, the, out of the storehouse because what he was doing was evil for him to be living there. It was not a good thing. And so it's important that we should recognize when evil comes upon our lives and we shouldn't allow evil to settle and make room in our in our hearts, in our lives, whatever. Just like Nehemiah, when we recognize that evil is coming into our lives, whether it's in our hearts, we're hardening, hardening our hearts, or is the people that are coming in that we know is not from God, just like what Nehemiah did, we should throw those things out, throw those people out. Because when they make room, they grow, they fester. It's like planting seeds. If you keep watering the same seed, it's going to grow and grow into something that we don't want, like weeds, you know, for example. And so it's really important that we're just, we're diligent and we're discerning those things. And so just like Nehemiah, we have to have that bold attitude where we don't play with evil. We don't tolerate evil in our lives, but that we're willing to kick those things out and move it out of, out of our, our lives and our um, vicinities. And so 10 and 11, it says, I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for, responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. So I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of the Lord neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their post. And kind of like what Sister Coca talked about, we should not neglect the house of the Lord. This is something that we should not do, you know, not neglect the house of the Lord with our resources, whether it's our time, our finances, whatever that case might be, because those are things that God gave us. And so to give thanks, since we tied under the, the order of Melchizedek, we need to give thanks. Give God thanks. We tie because we're blessed. And so we should not neglect God's house, but Find out how we how we can serve in God's house. What roles can we play and how can we advance God's kingdom? And so 12 and 13, all, Ju all Judah brought the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil into the storerooms. I put Shem 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 Lemel, Shelemiah, the priest, Zodok, Zadok, the scribe, and the Levite named Padiah, in charge of the storerooms and made Hanan, son of Zachar, the son of Mataniah, their assistant, because they were considered trustworthy. They were made responsible for distributing the supplies of their fellow Levites. So again, we see that when assigning responsibilities of kingdom assignments, it's important that we only give responsibilities to those that we deem trustworthy. We just don't give certain roles to certain people because we know that they cannot faithfully steward those things. It says that they were made, I'm sorry, it says that the sons of Matani, their assistant, because they were because they were considered trustworthy. They were considered trustworthy, which is why they were responsible for these, those, um, you know, the things guarding the storeroom. They were made responsible for distributing the supplies to their fellow Levites. So again, really important that when, even in, in kingdom advancement, that when, you know, pastors or leaders are, are assigning different roles, that they're giving it to those that they know are trustworthy and can handle the things that the Lord needs us to handle. And of course, we also need to make sure that we're those trustworthy people, that we can be trusted with those gifts and those uh, responsibilities. And so verse 14, it says, remember me for this, my God, and do not blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and its service. And so God honors those who are faithful and diligent in building his kingdom. And so God sees our work. He sees our efforts, the things that we do unto the Lord. He'll surely bless us and surely return um, his thanks to us because God is, we can't outgive God. You know, if we give God our praise, we give God our tithes, we give God our time, whatever, God will give us double because we can never outgive God. So God is also a giver and he loves to be a cheerful giver, which is why he calls us to be a cheerful giver. So, you know, God will bless us for the things that we're doing and for the efforts that we're making and advancing his kingdom. 
And so 15 and 18, in, in those days, I saw people in Judah, in Judah threading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in grain and loading it on the donkeys, together with wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of loads. They were bringing all of this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Therefore, I warned against them selling on that day. People from Tyre who, uh, Tyre who lived in Jerusalem were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them in, Ju in Jerusalem on the Sabbath to the people of Judah. I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, what is this wicked thing you are doing, desecrating the Sabbath day? And so kind of uh, like we learned from Zizekoko, the previous uh, chapters, it talks about the importance of the Sabbath and how um, we keep these things and, you know, by honoring God. And so, yeah. And so it's really important that we're faithful to do that. But I, a question I wanted to ask you all, because I know like in today's modern um, society, I know like when we read the, the New Testament, Jesus was seen honoring the Sabbath, you know, but today we live in a pretty busy world. Like I feel like most of our things, they do get done on the Sabbath, whether it's Saturday, Sunday, you know, throughout the weekend, that's where most people have the freedom from work and all those other things, you know, so how, how, I don't know, like a question I want to ask you all, like, how can we actually keep the Sabbath in today's day? You know, um, how can we go about doing that? Because we don't want to disobey God. So what are ways that we can actually keep the Sabbath, but also do the things that we need to do and the responsibilities that we have? Does anyone know, or would like to share anything that they maybe do or any advice, suggestions? Amen. I would think that uh, today we, it does not matter the day of the week you choose, but uh, it's for you to choose that day and consecrate that day to the Lord. That's your Sabbath. And when you say today is my Sabbath, all that you want to do for the Lord, make sure you do it because it's like you make a covenant, you make a vow to the Lord. So on that day, make that day holy for you and God mm -hmm. and uh, do according to what you tell your God. That's keeping the Sabbath. That's mm -hmm. what I think for me. Yeah, every day can be your Sabbath. Any day you choose can be your Sabbath, but just be faithful and do what you told God you wanted to do for him, for him alone. Amen. Thank you. And to add to that, Sister Coco, well, quite another question. Would that be like a whole day, a few hours, you know, how, how would that look like? You know, God is looking for someone to come and talk to him alone. God mm -hmm. wants us to have intimacy with him. If you want to give God one hour, God will take that hour. Give it to him in quality time. He wanted to be quality, not the quantity. Yeah. That's yeah. what God wants. Yeah. Thank you. Amen. Okay, yes. And thank you so much, Sister Koko, for that uh, this thing. Yes, and like what she said, it's so true. It depends on each and every individual, right? And the uh, to me also I was like thinking because it, it like you know, if you know it depends on your 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 purpose, also your assignment, because like most often, you know, it's like we all have different gifts. Like let's say I for one probably. If I know my gift, then I want to like go before God, like on that Sabbath and uh, say, I want to do it daily because we all have a different routine, how yeah. we do our things. So, you know, somebody might do it this way. Somebody might do it this way. So it's just depend on us that you and God, the agreement, your covenant with you and God too. To me, that's the way I looked at it also. Yeah. Amen. Thank you for sharing. Amen. Well, thank you both ladies for sharing um, because, you know, I, I think it's really important that we understand how we can keep the Sabbath and not um, find ourselves getting so busy with, with today's world that we live in, you know, because the Bible says that we shouldn't conform to the patterns of this world, but we should be transformed by the renewings of our minds. And the way we, we are transformed is by knowing what God expects of us. So thank you both for sharing and giving good advice. Okay, so moving on to 23 and 27, it says, moreover, okay, moreover in those days, I saw men of Judah who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod or the language of one of the other peoples and did not know to speak the language of Judah. I rebuked them and called curses down on them. I beat some of the men and pulled out their hair. 
I made them take an oath in God's name and said, you are not to give your daughters in marriage to their sons, nor are you to take their granddaughters in marriage for your sons or for yourselves. Was it not because of marriages like this that King Solomon of Israel sinned? Um, along among the, the many nations, there was no king like him. He was loved by God and God made him king over all Israel. But even he was led into sin by by he was even he was led into sin by foreign women must we hear now that you too are doing all this terrible wickedness and are being unfaithful to god by marrying foreign women <laughs> um this part was so funny to me especially the part where he like he beat them and pulled out their hair <laughs> but it just goes to show how important it is that we're careful who we marry and intermingle ourselves with. You know, to him, to, it was very serious the fact that he had to rebuke them and called curses down on them as it says in, in verse 25 and beat them and pull out their hair. It was very serious that these people of, of a different kingdom would not marry foreign people. And so it's not that they were racist or said you can only marry Africans, you can only marry whites, you can only marry blacks. That's that's not what he was saying. He was saying you can only marry people who are of the same yoke as you, which is God. You know, what what good is it a Christian marrying someone that is not safe? Because they're gonna have two different fathers. One is gonna have the father of hell, devil, and one is gonna have the father of God, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so when you marry someone that is not of the same, you know the same kingdom as you, then it's hard to really advance God's kingdom because there's constant fighting back and forth. You're going to tear God's kingdom in instead. And so it's really, <laughs> it's really important that when we're trying to, you know, for those that aren't married or for those that are just even, it's not just about marriage. I think it's also about just relationships, you know, because God mm -hmm. is a God of relationship. And so God is not saying that we shouldn't be friends with people who are of the world. We should be because hopefully our testimony, like we talked about earlier, can be used as a witness to bring them to God's kingdom. But when we are constantly entangling our, our, ourselves with people that are not of God, we start to drift. We start to, to adapt, adapt to their ways because it's easier to pull someone down and to pull someone up, you know, because just the force of matter. And so it's really important that when we do have these uh, ungodly relationships in our lives that we're careful with how we interact because it says in in proverbs you know bad character corrupts good character or bad company sorry correct corrupts good character and so that we're careful that we just we don't get advice from them if anything we should be that that good example that godly example that can bring those people to christ but when it comes to marrying you know that's something that he completely rebuked them again that we should not marry those that are not of the same kingdom because it's going to be hard to advance God's kingdom when we're, you know, doing, we want to do two different things. And so it's just the importance of being equally yoked in marriages, friendships, relationships, et cetera. Amen. Thank you. And so the last, the last verse I'm going to read before I leave the floor open is going to be 30, which is the end of the chapter. It says, so I purified the priests and the Levites of everything foreign and assigned them duties, each to his own task. And so we talked a lot about assignments, specializations, just each person having a role to play. And so it's really important that, again, we are doing the task that the Lord has called us to do. You know, kind of like what Sister Miranda said, it's important that we know our purpose. We know what God has called us to do because we can be diligent in doing those things. We should ask God accordingly to what his, what our gifts are because each person has different gifts. So if your gift is one thing, what the next person does would not apply to us because we'll need to spend more time. You know, what she mentioned as far as like, how do we honor the Sabbath? If one person's gift is to, you know, be a priest and lead and basically fill, fill in the roles of that shepherd, then that person needs to consistently seek God because they're not only leading themselves, but they're leading other people to Christ. So they need to constantly be hearing from God. Not that we, we, we should all have that, that, that zeal and passion for God, but someone that is maybe just called to be a lawyer, they won't need to have the exact same zeal as a pastor and exact same efforts. Yes, it's important that we do. I'm not, I'm not taking that away, but just, just understanding the roles, you know, each person has to do things according to what God has called them to do. And so how do we know what God has called us to do? We have a relationship, we ask God and we seek out his face and he'll direct us. He'll show us different ways that he's called us to do whatever we need to do to advance his kingdom. Um, so 
yeah, that is that is everything I have to share as far as uh, chapter 13. So I will leave room open for discussions or any additions. Amen. Thank you, Sister Miranda, uh, Sister Malis, for covering these two last chapters. They were all rich. Thank you so much. I like how Nehemiah, as a great leader, show us how he uh, diligence, obedience, sacrifice. Uh, he had stamina in whatever he was doing. And the last verse of the whole book is telling her, so I purified the priests and the Levites of everything foreign and assigned them duties, each one to his own task. I also made provision for contribution of wood at the designated time and for the first fruit. Remember me in favor, my God. He always pray. Mm -hmm. I like Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a so great leader. Mm -hmm. Continue by purifying even the priest, the Levites of every foreign. Make sure we do not allow any foreign thing in the kingdom of God. And then he helped them in assignment of duties, each to his own tax, each one with their personal assignment, with their family assignment, how we see the name of the sons of the sons. And he made his own provision for contribution. Whatever he is pushing people to do, he does himself and even more. He showed them example. He himself was the example of the people to follow. He is a leader that needs to be followed. And he made leaders as well. Because when he was choosing leaders, he did not just choose them because they are more for his family or and uh, he likes them. He followed them and make sure they are going to keep the work done. They are going to be trustworthy. They have been trustworthy, so they will continue to be trustworthy and be faithful. So thank every, I thank everybody for contributing for the study of the book of Nehemiah. I have learned a lot. We have uh, learned a lot, and I pray that the Lord will help each one of us to put what we have learned into practice and remember God to favor us for what <laughs> we are doing in your kingdom. That is uh, his last prayer. I so much love it. Thank you all. Thank the Holy Spirit that was with us throughout this study. Amen. Amen. The contribution is welcome. <laughs> Did you want to say something, Sister Miranda? Thank you. Oh, Sister, um, <laughs> Mr. Kuka has said everything, you know, that um, just Neymar being a great leader is something, you know, we're doing the, the 21, uh, if the about this thing, the book, you know, it was all about leadership stuff, right? Adding, adding with this one again. <laughs> so we have so much about leadership now that <laughs> on this platform, you know. So we just want to thank God for who Neymar was for the kind of a leader that he was strong, brave, and then he had the people in heart, you know, keep the people's safety, secure, and they, they, they make the people to obey, you know, the kind of heart that they had towards others. So it's not just all about you, but all the, 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 co the community that you serve, you know, you put the, the community first, mm -hmm. and it's not like, you are not only serving God, you know, you are seeking God to serve the community, to bring the, you, 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 like we, wanna, we don't want to advance all by ourselves. We want to advance like a body of Christ together. So that's something that is so wonderful. Thank you so much for tonight. Amen. Thank you. Just to add to the last part you said, Sister Miranda, I really like that, where you said that we don't want to advance God's kingdom ourselves. And that's basically, if, if we, you re notice, that's exactly what Nehemiah was good at. He was yeah. good at giving each person their assignment. Um, because as leaders, sometimes, you know, leaders, they get so overwhelmed thinking that they have to do everything on their own. Mm -hmm. And it's important that we have delegation so that way each person can do something to not overwhelm exactly. the people. And I, exactly. I think of... of uh, I think Exodus, I'm sorry, Exodus, where Moses was the leader and Moses was trying to do everything. He was trying to pray for the people and do okay, this. Yes. 
and his father-in-law was like you're gonna wear yourself out you can't <laughs> yeah d- d- truth. yes <laughs> yeah death row. so he was like you know you need to ask other people to do this mm-hmm. because and and that's important that we also recognize that you know whether pastor Mildred, pastor um pastor kwame mm-hmm. Uh, they're they're having so many different things to do we as that body we have to make sure that we're, we're helping one another out reach out to them mm-hmm. okay, how can I help you know and I think uh, like kind of this is what sister Coco is doing as she has been leading the book of Nehemiah mm-hmm. where this is a, a task that she was she was given because she wanted to take away the stress from the leaders exactly. you know, we need to be diligent in doing that where we're not just waiting to be asked as passionate exactly. all the time Amen. but you also reach out to say okay how can we take the load out of you know your hands and what can we do to serve you and also to serve god's kingdom Amen. yeah Amen. Amen. thank you everyone thank you so much Anybody has something else to add? Sister Desiree, we miss your voice. All right, if uh, there is no more contribution we that are on the line, I would like us all to lift our voice and just pray and thank the Lord for all that he has taught us in this book of Nehemiah. And ask the grace of the Lord to help us. I'm Amen. here. I'm just taking it all in. Glory to God. Thank y'all so much. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Amen. We are all going to lift our voice tonight and thank the Lord for all that we have learned from Nehemiah. And ask the Holy Spirit to help us to put into practice, to bring all those to our memory when the time comes. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you. We bless your name. We give you glory. For the day, three weeks we just spent. For your praises, for your leadership, for helping us to understand how to accept the assignment of the Lord and how to go back to him and ask for grace. Since chapter one, Nehemiah went to the Lord first to ask the Lord to make a way for the Lord him to go. Assignment. Yes, Lord, you were so faithful. You touched the heart of the king. The king supported you for goods, you for decrees to help Nehemiah to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And Father, where when the enemy came, proper him, Father, you strengthen him, you give him boldness to carry on, trusting on you, knowing that if you are not the one building, the wall will not be rebuilt. Trusted you, and you were with him. Your hand was steadfast on Nehemiah and his team, and Father, you led them to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. Thank you, Father, for all the many strategies you gave Nehemiah. And some of the adorers support Nehemiah in the assignment. Lord, I bless your name for sending them. Destiny help us on our way. Father, we thank you, Lord, for opening our eyes, giving us the discernment to know who this is and how to rebuke the enemy anytime it comes to disturb our peace in the assignment. Lord, we honor him, but we bless you. Thank you, Father, for helping the Israelites that came by the answer. Go through the law by the help of Ezra to understand how multiple times you have rescued the children of Israel. And multiple times they were stubborn and went back to the earth, back to their own ways. I do in a terrible blasphemy. I sin in against you, yes, Father. You were so gracious and you forgive them and restore them again and again. Father, we just want to thank you for your love, for your mighty hand 
over their life two hours the generations father we thank you for not living us not forsaking us even if we sin Lord we bless your name we give you glory oh father we thank you for who you are we bless your name father we pray that as they have been about to you to come back to you Papa we pray that any time we come back to you Holy Spirit strengthen us to rise up and fulfill our vow to the Lord and when we are called for our deep assignment we remember it's not about us but it's about the kingdom of God because other people too are going to be affected other people too are going to be blessed if we don't do our assignment many people will not get the blessing and many people will not see the hand of God in their lives so Papa we pray and we ask for your grace we ask for your strength we ask for your leadership our assignment to bring it to completion, Father God. Because you that have called us, you are faithful God. And why you have started for each one of us, we trust you that you will help us to bring it to completion in the name of Jesus. Oh Lord, we thank you, Papa. I bless your name for the life of my sister, my niece, that has the assignment, Father God. May you be her reward, Father. Thank you for Sister Miranda that was there every day since we started bringing her contribution. Oh Lord, I thank you for touching her life as well with this book of Nehemiah. Thank you, Lord, for this life of Sister Petita, Sister Dede, Sister Desiree, and all the ones that will come and listen. Pastor John, that help us a lot. If a lot of us thank you for blessing them all. Thank you, Lord, for using each one of us to address your kingdom. Thank you, Father, for teaching us many strategies in the book of Nehemiah. Lord, we bless your name. Father, we give you glory. We give you honor. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 We share the grace. May the grace, grace of our Lord Jesus Lord Christ, Christ, the love of God, Lord of God and the fellowship of the Holy, of the Holy Spirit, Spirit rest and abide with us Spirit now and forever. And forever. Surely, Surely, God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Amen.